Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott, and I'm delighted today we're going to finally do an episode from Thomas Troward. Thomas Troward was an amazing New Thought author, and his works influenced many, many other authors. According to Alcoholics Anonymous, many members were encouraged by his Edinburgh lectures, and he was a president of the International New Thought Alliance. Genevieve Barrent, who we haven't covered yet, was a personal student. Bob Proctor claims that one of the most powerful works that he ever wrote was the creative process in the individual. But most importantly, I was inspired after reading The Wheels of Truth by Joseph Murphy and reading his biography. It said that although he had studied with some of the most intelligent and far-sighted professors, Joseph Murphy was uniquely inspired by Dr. Thomas Troward. Troward was a judge as well as a philosopher, a doctor, and a professor, and Judge Troward became Joseph's mentor. From him, he not only learned philosophy, theology, and law, but he also was introduced to mysticism and particularly the Masonic Order. Many of the biblical teachings that we get from Joseph Murphy come from Thomas Troward. I have theorized in the past that he was inspired by Abdullah, but it may be Thomas Troward, and it's very, very similar to Neville Goddard. Now, I certainly plan on reading the creative process in the individual as a whole at some point, and the law and the word, which is truly amazing. But in Thomas Troward's book, Bible Mystery and Bible Meaning, there are two really interesting chapters, one called The Devil and one The Spirit of the Antichrist. Oftentimes I get messages and comments on my videos where people talk about the devil and the Antichrist as if he is real. And I've discussed this previously in some other episodes, one with Joseph Murphy, one on a Dolores Cannon episode that ended up having to be removed. But oftentimes our understandings of the devil and the Antichrist become a sort of spiritual disease for many people. And I found these teachings to be very interesting in the concept of the devil and the Antichrist as it's written in the Bible. Troward had a unique way of interpreting the Bible, very similar to Goddard and Murphy, and I think you'll enjoy it. Troward begins by saying, It is impossible to read the Bible and ignore the important part which it assigns to the devil. The devil first appears as the serpent in the story of the fall and figures throughout Scripture till the final scene in Revelations where the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, is cast into the lake of fire. What then is meant by the devil? We may start with the self-obvious proposition that God and the devil must be the exact opposites of each other. Whatever God is, the devil is not. Then, since God alone is, the devil is not. Since God is being, the devil is not being. And so we are met by the paradox that though the Bible says so much about the devil, yet the devil does not exist. It is precisely this fact of non-existence that makes up the devil. It is that power which in appearance is, and in reality is not. In a word, it is the power of the negative. We are put upon this track by the statement in 2 Corinthians 20, that in Christ all the promises of God are yea and amen. That is essentially affirmative, in other words, that all our growth towards perfected humanity must be recognition of the positive and not by recognition of the negative. The prime fact of negation is its nothingness, but owing to the impossibility of ever divesting our thought of its creative power, our conception of the negative as something having a substantive existence of its own becomes a very real power indeed. And it is this power that the Bible calls the devil and Satan. The same old serpent which we find beguiling Eve in the book of Genesis, it is equally a mistake to say that there is an evil power or that there is not. Let us examine this paradox. A little consideration will show us that it is impossible for there to be an infinite and universal power of evil, or unless the infinite and universal power were creative, nothing could exist. 
If it be creative, then it is the life principle working always for self-expression, and to suppose the undifferentiated principle of life acting otherwise than life-givingly would contradict the very idea of its livingness. Whatever tends to expand and improve life is the good, and therefore it is a primary intuition from which we cannot get away that the infinite, originating, and maintaining power can only be good. But to find this absolute and unchangeable good, we require to get to the very bedrock of being, to that as yet undifferentiated life in itself, inherent in and forming one with universal primordial substance, of which I have spoken in a former chapter. This all underlying life is forever expressing itself through form, but the form is not the life, and it is from not seeing this that so much confusion arises. The universal life principle simply as such finds expression as much in one form as another, and is just as active in the scattered particles which once made a human body as it was in those particles when they cohered together in the living man. This is merely the well-recognized scientific truth of the conservation of energy. On the other hand, we cannot help perceiving that there is something in the individual which exercises a greater power than the perpetual energy residing in the ultimate atoms. For otherwise, what is it that maintains in our bodies for perhaps a century the unstable equilibrium of atomic forces which, when that something is withdrawn, cannot continue for 24 hours? Is this something another something then that which is at work as the perpetual energy within the atoms? No, for otherwise there would be two originating powers in the universe, and if our study of the Bible teaches us anything, it is that the originating power is only one, and we must therefore conceive of the power we are examining as the same power that resides in the ultimate atoms, only now working at a higher level. It has wielded the atoms into a distinct organism, however lowly, and so to distinguish this mode of power from the mere atomic energies, we may call it the integrating power or the power which builds up. Now evolution is a continuous process of building up, and what makes the world of today a different world from that of the ichthyosaurus and the pterodactyl is the successive building up of more and more complex organisms culminating at last in the production of man as an organism, both physically and mentally capable of expressing the life of the supreme intelligence by means of individual consciousness. Why then should not the power which is able to carry on the race as a perpetually improving expression of itself do the same thing in the individual? That is the question with which we have to deal. In other words, why need the individual die? Why should he not go on in perpetual expansion? This question may seem absurd in the light of past experience. Those who believe only in blind forces answer that death is the law of nature, and those who believe in the divine wisdom answer that it is the appointment of God. But strange as it may seem, both these answers are wrong. That death should be the ultimate law of nature contradicts the principle of continuity as exemplified in the lifeward tendency of evolution and that it is the will of God is most emphatically denied by the Bible, for that tells us that he that has the power of death is the devil. Hebrews 2.14 There is no beating about the bush, not God, but the devil sends death. There is no getting out of the plain words. Let us examine this statement. We have seen that whatever God is, the devil must be the opposite, and therefore if God is the power that builds up, the integrating power, the devil, must be the power that pulls down, or the disintegrating power. Now what is disintegration? It is the breaking up of what was previously an integer or perfect whole, the separation of its component parts. But what is it that causes the separation? It is still the building up power, only the law of affinity by which it works is now acting from other centers so as to build up other organisms. The universal power is still at its building work, only it seems to have lost sight of its original motive in the organism which is falling to pieces, and to have taken up fresh motives in other directions. And this is precisely the state of the case. 
it is just the want of continuous motive that causes disintegration. The only possible motive of the all-originating life principle must be the expression of life, and, therefore, we may almost picture it as continually seeking to embody itself in intelligences, which shall be able to grasp its motive and cooperate with it by keeping that motive constantly in mind. Granted that this individualization of motive could take place, there appears no reason why it should not continue to work on indefinitely. A tree is an organized center of life, but without the intelligence which would enable it to individualize the motive of the universal life principle, it individualizes a certain measure of the universal vital energy, but it does not individualize the universal intelligence. And therefore, when the measure of energy which it has individualized is exhausted, it dies. And the same thing happens with animals and men. But as the particular intelligence advances in the recognition of itself as the individualization of the universal intelligence, it becomes more and more capable of seizing upon the initial motive of the universal mind and giving it permanence. And supposing this recognition to be complete, the logical result would be never ceasing and perpetually expanding individual life, thus bringing us back to those promises which I have quoted in the opening pages of this book and reminding us of the master's statement to the women of Samaria that the Father is always seeking, those who will still worship Him in spirit and in truth, that is, those who can enter into the spirit of what the Father is aiming at. But what happens in the absence of a perfect recognition of the universal motive? Is that sooner or later the machinery runs down and the motive is transferred to other centers where the same process is repeated, and so life and death alternate with each other in a ceaseless round. The disintegrating process is the universal builder taking the materials for fresh construction from a tenement without a tenant, that is, from an organism which has not reached the measure of intelligence necessary to perpetuate the universal motive in itself, or as the Master put it, in the parable of the ten virgins such as have not a supply of oil to keep their lamps burning. This negative disintegrating force is the integrating power working, so to say, at a lower level relative to that at which it had been working in the organism that is being dissolved. It is not another power. Both the Bible and common sense tell us that ultimately there can only be one power in the universe, which must therefore be the building power, so that there can be no such thing as a power which is negative in itself. But it shows itself negatively in relation to the particular individual if through want of recognition he fails to provide the requisite conditions for it to work positively. Work it always will, for its very being is ceaseless activity, but whether it will act positively or negatively towards any particular individual depends entirely on whether he provides positive or negative conditions for its manifestation, just as we may produce a positive or a negative current according to the electrical conditions which we supply. We see then that what gives the positive power a negative action is the failure to intelligently recognize our own individualization of it. In the lower forms of life this failure is inevitable because they are not provided with an organism capable of such a recognition. In man the suitable organism is present, but he seeks knowledge only from past experiences which have necessarily been of the negative order, and does not, by the combined action of reason and faith, look into the infinite for the unfoldment of limitless possibilities. And so he employs his intelligence to deny that which, if he affirmed it, would be in him the spring of perpetual renovation. The power of the negative, therefore, has its root in our denial of the affirmative. And so we die because we have not yet learned to understand the principle of life. We have yet to learn the great law that the higher mode of intelligence controls the lower. In consequence of our ignorance, we attribute an affirmative power to the negative, that is to say, the power of taking an initiative on its own account, not seeing that it is a condition resulting from the absence of something more positive. And so the power of the negative consists in affirming that to be true which is not true. And for this reason it is called in scripture the father of lies, 
or that principle from which all false statements are generated. The word devil means false accuser or false affirmer, and this name is therefore in itself sufficient to show us that what is meant is the creative principle of affirmation used in the wrong direction, a truth which has been handed down to us from old times in the saying diabolus est deus inversus. This is how it is that the devil can be a vast impersonal power while at the same time having no existence, and so the paradox with which we started is solved. And now also it becomes clear why we are told that the devil has the power of death. If it is not held by a personal individual, but results quite naturally from that ignorant and inverted thought, which is the spirit that denies. This is the exact opposite to the Son of God, in whom all things are only yea and amen. That is the spirit of the affirmative, and therefore the spirit of life. And so it is that the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil, and deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews 2.14 Again, we are told that the devil is Satan. This name appears to be another form of Saturn and may also be connected with the root sat or seven. Saturn being in the old symbolical astronomy, the outermost or seventh planet. In that system, the center is occupied by soul or the sun, which represents the life-giving principle and Saturn represents the opposite extreme. Or matter at the point furthest removed from pure spirit. Now taken in due order, matter or concrete form is as necessary as spirit itself, for without it there could be no manifestation of spirit, in other words, there could be no existence at all. Seen from this point of view, there is nothing evil in it, but on the contrary it may be compared to the lamp which concentrates the light and gives it a particular direction, and in this aspect matter is called Lucifer or the light bearer. This is matter taking its proper place in the order of the kingdom of heaven. But if Lucifer falls from heaven, becomes rebellious, and endeavors to usurp the place of soul, then it is the fallen archangel and becomes Satan, or that outermost planet which moves in orbit, whose remoteness from the warmth and light of the sun renders all human life and joy impossible, a symbolism which we retain in our common speech when we say, that a man has a Saturnine aspect. Thus Satan is the same old serpent that deceived Eve. It is the wrong belief that sets merely secondary causes, which are only conditions in the place of first cause or that originating power of thought, which makes enlightened man the image of his maker and the son of God. But we must not make the mistake of supposing that because there is no universal devil, in the sense, as there is universal God, therefore there are no individual devils. The Bible frequently speaks of them, and one of the commissions given by the master to his followers was to cast out devils. The word used for the devil, or in the Greek, diabolos, and in the Hebrew, Satan, both having the same general meaning of the principle of negation, but individual devils are called in Hebrew, sair, a hairy one, and in the Greek, daemon, a spirit or shade, and these terms indicate evil spirits having personal identity. Now, without stopping to discuss the question whether there are orders of spiritual individualities which have never been human, let us confine our attention to the immense multitudes of disembodied human spirits which, under any hypothesis, must crowd the realms of the unseen. Can we suppose them all to be good? Certainly not, for we have no reason to suppose that mere severance from its physical instrument either changes the moral quality or expands the intelligence of the mind. And therefore, if there is such a thing as survival after death at all, we cannot conceive of the other world otherwise than as containing millions upon millions of spirits in various stages of ignorance and ill will, and consequently ready to make the most unscrupulous use of their powers where opportunity offers. The time is fast passing away when it will be possible to regard such a conception as fantastic and taking our stand simply upon the well-ascertained ground of thought, transference, and telepathy, we may well ask if such powers as these can be exercised 
by the spiritual entity, while still clothed in flesh, why should they not be equally or even more powerfully employed by spirits out of the flesh? This opens an immense field of inquiry which we cannot stop to investigate, but setting aside all other classes of evidence on the subject, the experimentally ascertained facts of telepathy bring to light possibilities which would explain all that the Bible says regarding the malefic influence of evil spirits. But the inference to be drawn from this is not that we should go in continual terror of obsession or other injury, but that we should realize that our position as sons and daughters of the Almighty places us beyond the reach of such malignant entities. Our familiar principle, the law of attraction, is at work here also. Like attracts like. And if we would keep these undesirable entities at a distance, we can do so most effectively by centering our thoughts on those things which we know from their nature cannot invite evil influences. Let us follow the apostolic advice, and whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4, 8. Then, however, far the law of attraction may extend from us into the other world, we may rest assured that it will only act to bring us in touch with that innumerable company of angels and spirits of just men made perfect, of whom we are told in the twelfth chapter of Hebrews, and one because they are joined in the same worship of the one divine spirit as ourselves, can only act in accordance with the principles of harmony and love. I will not attempt the analysis of so important a subject in the short space at my disposal, but I would caution all students against tampering with anything that savors of ceremonial magic. However little acknowledged in public, it is by no means unfrequently practiced at the present day, and, if on no other grounds, it should be resolutely shunned as a powerful system of auto-suggestion capable of producing the most disastrous effects on those who employ it. No new thought reader can be ignorant of the power of auto-suggestion, and I would therefore ask each one to think out for himself what the tendency of auto-suggestion conducted on such lines as these must be. I speak as unto wise men, judge ye what I say. The Bible is by no means silent on this subject, but I may sum up its teaching in a few lines. It assumes throughout the possibility of intercourse between men and spirits. But with the exception of the Master's temptation, where I understand a symbolic representation of the general principle of evil, the power of the negative which we have already considered, it should be remarked that all its record is of appearances of good angels as ministering spirits to heirs of salvation. Nor were these visitants sought after by those who received them. Their appearance was always spontaneous, and the solitary instance which the Bible records of a spirit appearing whom it was sought to raise by incantation is of the appearance of Samuel to Saul, announcing that his rebellion had culminated in this act of witchcraft, and this was followed by the suicide of Saul on the next day. If then our study of the Bible has led us to the conclusion that it is the statement of the law of the inevitable sequences of cause and effect, this uniform direction of its teachings must indicate the presence of certain sequences in this connection also, which follow definite laws, although we may not yet understand them. This knowledge will come to us by degrees with the natural expansion of our powers, and when it arrives in its proper order, we shall be qualified to use it. And if we realize that there is a universal mind capable of guiding us at all, we may trust it not to keep back from us anything. It is necessary we should know at each stage of our onward journey. Do we want knowledge? The Master has promised that the Spirit of Truth shall guide us into all truth. Should not a people seek unto their God instead of unto them that have familiar spirits? Isaiah 9.19 There is a reason at the back of all these things. We thus see that the whole question of the power of evil turns on the two fundamental laws which I spoke of in the opening pages of this book as forming the basis of Bible teaching the law of suggestion, and the law of the creative power of thought. 
the conception of an abstract principle of evil, the devil, receives its power from our own auto-suggestion of its existence, and the power of evil spirits results from a mental attitude which allows us to receive their suggestions. Then, in both cases, the suggestion having been accepted, our own creative power of thought does the rest, and so prepares the way for receiving still further suggestions of the same sort. Now the antidote to all of this is a right conception of God or the universal spirit of life as the one and only originating power. If we realize that relatively to us this power manifests itself through the medium of our own thought and that in so doing it in no way changes its inherent quality of life-givingness, this recognition must constitute such a supremely powerful and all-embracing suggestion as must necessarily eradicate all suggestions of a contrary description. And so our thought, being based on this supreme suggestion of good, is certain to have a correspondingly life-giving character. To recognize the essential oneness of this power is to recognize it as God, and to recognizing its essential life-givingness is to recognizing it as love. And so we shall realize in ourselves the truth that God is love. Then, if God be for us, who can be against us? And so we realize the further truth that perfect love casteth out fear, with the results that in our own world there can be no devil. The Spirit of Antichrist When we have realized the essential nature of any principle, we can form a pretty fair guess as to the general lines on which it will show itself in action, whether in individuals or institutions, nations, or events. The evolution of principles is the key to all history in the past, and similarly, it is the key to all the history that is to come. Therefore, if we grasp the significance of any principle, though we may not be able to prophesy particular events, we shall be able to form a general idea of the sort of developments its prevalence must give rise to. Now all through the Bible we find the statement of two leading principles which are diametrically opposed to one another, the principle of sonship or reliance upon God and its opposite or the denial of God, and it is this latter that is called the spirit of Antichrist. This spirit or mode of thought is described in the second chapter of the second epistle to the Thessalonians and the fourth chapter of the first epistle to Timothy. And its distinctive note is that it sets itself up in the temple of God, placing itself above all that is worshipped. And a similar description is given in Daniel 11, 36-39. Widespread development of this inverted principle, the Bible tells us, is the key to the history of the latter days, those times in which we now live. And the prophetic scriptures are largely occupied with the struggle which must take place between the opposing principles. It is impossible for the two to amalgamate for they are in direct antagonism and the Bible tells us that though the struggle may be severe the victory must at last remain with those who worship God and the reason for this becomes evident if we look at the fundamental nature of the principles themselves one is the principle of the affirmative and the other is the principle of the negative one is that which builds up and the other is that which pulls down one consents to the initiative being taken by that spirit which has brought all creation into existence, and the other bids this spirit take a back seat and denies that it has any power of initiative. This is the essence of the opposition between the two principles. Whatever the one affirms, the other denies, and so since no agreement is possible, the conflict between them must continue until one or the other gets the final victory. Now, with the spirit of the Antichrist is what the Bible describes it, we cannot shut our eyes to the fact that it is now present among us. St. Paul tells us that it was already beginning to work in his day, only that at that time there was a hindrance to its fuller development. But he adds that when that hindrance should be removed, the development of the spirit of Antichrist would be phenomenal. Various commentators on this text have explained the hindrance alluded to by St. Paul to have been the existence of the Roman Empire, and no doubt this is true as far as it goes. In this passage, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, 11, St. Paul reminds the Thessalonians of something he had told them on the subject, that is something he had communicated verbally and not in writing regarding the falling away which would take place before the resurrection. 
He said, Remember ye not, when I was yet with you, I told you of these things, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. The very earliest traditions tell us that St. Paul had then verbally explained to the Thessalonians was that the Roman Empire as then existing must pass away before these further developments could take place. But he has careful not to print this in writing, lest it should expose the Christians to additional persecution on the charge of being enemies of the state. The tradition that this was what St. Paul had told the Thessalonians is by no means a vague one. We first find it mentioned by Arrhenius, the disciple of Polycarp, who was himself the disciple of St. John, so that we get it on the authority of one who had been instructed by a personal friend and acquaintance of the apostles, and we may therefore feel assured that in this tradition we have a correct statement of what St. Paul had said regarding the nature of the hindrance to which he alludes in this epistle. The existence of the Roman Empire then was doubtless the outward and immediate cause of this hindrance to the coming of Antichrist. But we must remember that at the back of the external and visible circumstances which are instrumental in the history of the world, there are mental and spiritual causes, and so the matter goes further and deeper than any existing political conditions. It is a question of spiritual principles, a question of causes, and so long as any given cause is at work, its effect will continue to show themselves, though the particular form they will assume will vary with the conditions under which the manifestations take place. Therefore, we may look deeper than the political conditions of St. Paul's time to find the spiritual and causal nature of the hindrance to which he alludes. He tells us that at the time that he wrote the spirit of Antichrist was already working, that its complete manifestation was delayed till a later period by reason of a certain impediment which would be removed in due time, and a comparison of his statement with that of St. Peter in the third chapter of the second epistle shows that the removal of this impediment and the full manifestation of the spirit of Antichrist were to be looked for in the time of the end. Now Daniel says the very same thing, and he points out the marks by which the time of the end is to be recognized. There are two. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And if this is not an accurate description of things at the present time, well, I leave the reader to fill in the blank. We may say, then, that the time when the hindrance to the manifestation of Antichrist is to be removed is a time when knowledge has been increased. If we reflect that the whole matter is one of spiritual powers, it is not reasonable to suppose that the hindrance which in St. Paul's time prevented the further development of the spiritual power of Antichrist was ignorance of the nature of spiritual power in general. Now this knowledge is becoming more and more widely diffused, and consequently the danger of its inverted application is today far greater than in St. Paul's time, and therefore the more we realize what potentialities open before us, the more it behooves us to be on guard lest we regard them in such a way as to take the place of God in the temple of God. It may or may not be that the man of sin exhibiting himself as God in the temple of God is to be understood as an actual ceremony taking place in an actual building, though even this is not altogether inconceivable if we recollect that during the French Revolution, a notorious actress was enthroned upon the high altar in the Cathedral of Notre Dame as the goddess of reason and received the public adoration of the official representatives of France. What has been may be again, and we may know that history repeats itself, but I think we have to look for something much more personal and powerful than any theatrical exhibition of this kind. If we search the scriptures, we shall find that the real temple of God is man, when Christ said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He spake of the temple of his body, John 2, 19-21. And again, St. Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? 1 Corinthians 16. Moreover, the promise is, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And so in many similar passages, a careful consideration of which leaves no doubt but that the true significance of the temple in Scripture is that of human individuality. The meaning then becomes clear. The temple which is profaned is that innermost sanctuary of our heart out of which come all the issues of our individual life. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. And if this be true, then it is of the utmost importance who is enthroned there. It is the all-originating creative spirit 
with its infinite love, wisdom, and power, or is it our personal knowledge and will? It must be one of the two. Which is it? The difference is immense, and it consists in this. If our personal knowledge, wisdom, and willpower are the highest things we know, then we are left exactly where we were and are making no advance. We may indeed accumulate a certain amount of knowledge of the hidden laws of physical and psychic forces not commonly known to our fellow men, which knowledge must necessarily carry a corresponding power along with it, but this only places us in a position where we more urgently need a higher knowledge and a higher wisdom to guide us. The greater power you put into one's hands, the more mischief will result if, through ignorance of its true uses, he misapplies it. He may understand the mere mechanism, so to say, of this power perfectly, so that he will know how to make it work. It is not on the mechanical side that the mistake will occur, but the mistake will be in the purpose to which the power is applied. And if that be wrong, the greater the power, the worse will be the results. You may teach a child to drive a motor car, but unless you can at the same time invest him with the powers of observation and caution and promptness of resource in an emergency beyond his years in driving will end in a smash. Now, it is just this inspiration of wisdom beyond our natural acuteness of foresight, beyond our unaided vision that we require for the really useful employment of any enhanced powers that may come to us as the result of our increasing knowledge. And this is not to be drawn from the knowledge of what we may call the merely mechanical working of the law of cause and effect, whether on the side of the visible or of the invisible. That knowledge, taken by itself, is only the lower knowledge, learning, so to say, how to do the particular trick. But to make it of real value, we need to know not only how to do it, but why to do it. And since the only true why is the building up of harmonious whole, both in ourselves and in the race, a whole which, by an organic connection between the causes sown today and the results produced tomorrow, shall continually germinate into greater and greater fullness of joyous life. Since the production of such a continuously growing and rejoicing wholeness is the only reasonable purpose to which our knowledge and our powers, whether great or small, can be applied. How are we to get such an outlook into the unending future and into our present relations in all their ultimate consequences by our own personal knowledge, however extended? We are sowing causes all the time with only a very limited outlook as to what they will produce. But if we are conscious that we have submitted our action to the guidance of the supreme wisdom and love, we know that we must be importing it into an adjustment to wholeness which will make it cooperative with the greater purpose of the universe. We cannot grasp that purpose in all its details and infinite extent, but we can see that it must be an unending growth into an ever-increasing manifestation of the life, love, and beauty which the all-originating spirit is in itself. That spirit is in itself unity, and its self-expression is through its manifestation in multiplicity. And the more clearly we see this, the more clearly we shall see that the way to cooperate with it is by seeking to make our own thought channel of its thought. But to do this is to recognize the presence of a divine intelligence guiding our thought and a divine power working through our actions. And this recognition coupled with the desire that our thought should be thus guided and our actions thus vivified is the very essence of worship. It is the very opposite to the mental attitude which sets itself up as needing no guidance and no help from a higher source and which denies the working of any higher power and so worship becomes the foundation principle of life. This does not mean a specific ceremonial observance but the adoption of a principle of worship which is the recognition of the true relation of the individual mind to the parent mind from which it springs. If anyone finds that a particular ceremonial conduces towards this end then that ceremonial is useful to him, but it does not follow that the same ceremonial is necessary for somebody else. It's just like watercolor painting. One man requires it to keep his paper dry through the whole progress of the work, while another paints entirely in the wet. Yet, if they are both artists, each will record his vision in a way that will unfold to the spectator some secret of nature's beauty. Each must use the means which is at his present stage, 
he finds most conducive to the end. Only let him remember that it is the end alone which really counts. Therefore, it is the great teacher laid down only one rule for worship and that it should be in spirit and in truth. The essence and not the form is what counts because the whole thing is a question of mental attitude. It is that attitude of constant receptiveness which is the only possible conscious correlative to the infinite divine givingness. To attain this is conscious union with the all-creating spirit. The logic of it may be briefly put thus, we want to come into touch with the power which originates the universe. But we cannot do this, and at the same time disqualify it by denying that it continues to be originative when it comes in touch with ourselves. Therefore, to be really in touch with it as the originating power we must let it lead us and not try to compel it, and to do this is to worship. The mark of the opposite mental attitude is to take no heed of such a guiding power, and then the only alternative to set oneself in its place. When we realize the spiritual causes are always at the back of external phenomena, and the more we come to see that the particular causes can be resolved into variations of an ultimate cause, the more our intent to rule that ultimate cause must result in self-deification. But the bad logic comes in not seeing that the real ultimate cause must be entirely originative, that this is just what makes it worth seeking and trying to deprive it of this power by attempting to compel it instead of looking to it for leading. It is just here that those who realize the nature of spiritual causation are in greater danger than the mere materialist. There really is an unseen force which can be controlled in the manner they contemplate and their mistake is in supposing that this force is the ultimate creating power. I dare say some readers will smile at this and I am well aware that it is quite possible to build up an apparently logical argument to show that what I am now speaking of is merely a fanciful idea. But to these I will now make any reply. The matter is one requiring careful development, and a partial and inadequate explanation would be more than useless. I must therefore leave its discussion to some other occasion, and in the meanwhile ask my readers to assume the existence of this force simply as a working hypothesis. In asking this, I am not asking more than they are ready to concede in the case of physical science, where it is necessary to assume the existence of purely speculative conditions of energy and matter if we would coordinate the observed phenomenon of nature into an intelligible whole. And in like manner, I would ask the critical reader to assume a working hypothesis, the existence of an essence intermediate between the originating spirit and the world of external manifestation. The existence of such an intermediary is a conclusion which has been arrived at by some of the deepest thinkers who ever lived. It has been called by various names in different countries and ages, but for the purposes of the present book, I think I cannot do better than adopt the name given to it by the European writers of the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. They called it Anima Mundi, or the soul of the world, as distinguished from Animus Dai, or the divine spirit, and they were careful to discriminate between the two. And if you look in a Latin dictionary, you will find that this word, which means life, mind, soul, is given a twofold form, masculine and feminine, Animus and Anima. Now it is in the dual nature thus indicated that the action of spiritual causation consists, and we cannot eliminate either of the two factors without involving a confusion of ideas which the recognition of their interaction would prevent us falling into. When once we recognize the nature and function of anima mundi, we shall find that under a variety of symbols it is referred to throughout the Bible, and indeed forms one of the principal subjects of a teaching. But to explain these Bible references in detail would require a book to itself. In general terms, however, we may say that anima mundi is the eternal feminine and the necessary correlative to the animus dei, the true originating spirit. It is what the medieval writers call the universal medium and is that principle which, as I pointed out in the opening chapter of this book, is esoterically called water. It is not the originating principle itself but it is that principle through which the originating principle operates. It is not originative, but receptive. Not the seed, but the ground, formative of that which is impregnated. As it is indicated by the old French expression, for it ventre saint Greece, the holy blue womb. The innermost maturing place of nature and its power is that of attracting the conditions necessary for the full maturing of that seed. 
with which it is impregnated and thus bringing about the growth which ultimately culminates in completed manifestation. Perhaps the idea may be best put in terms of modern Western thought by calling it the subconscious mind of the universe, and if we regard it in this light we may apply it all those laws of interaction between the conscious and subconscious mentality with which I conclude most of my readers are familiar. On this subject, I would refer the reader to my Edinburgh lectures on mental science. Now, the two chief characteristics of subconscious mind are its amenability to suggestion and its power of working out. Into material conditions, the logical consequences of suggestion impressed upon it. It is not originative, but formative. It does not provide the seed, but it causes it to grow. And the seed is the suggestion impressed upon it by the objective mind. If then, we credit the universal subjective mind with these same qualities, we find ourselves face to face with a stupendous power, which by its very nature affords a matrix for the germination of all the seeds of thought that are planted in it. Looking at the totality of nature as we see it, the various types of life, vegetable, animal, and human, and the evolution of these types from earlier ones, we can only come to the conclusion that the originating mind, animus Dei, as distinguished from animus mundi, must in the first instance see things generically the type rather than the individual, much as Plato puts it in the doctrine of archetypal ideas, and so the world as we know it is governed by a law of averages, which maintains and advances the race whatever may become of the individual. We may call this a generic or type creation, as distinguished from the conception of a specific creation of particular individuals. But as I have explained more fully in my book, The Creative Process in the Individual, the culminating point of such a generic creation must be the production of individual minds which are capable of realizing the general principle at work and therefore of giving its individual application. Now it is the imperfect apprehension of this principle that causes its inversion. It is recognizing anima mundi without animus dei. And the more a man sees of the immense possibility of his own thought and volition working upon animus mundi, while at the same time ignoring animus dei, the more likely he is to grow too big for his boots. He then logically has nothing to guide him but his own personal will, and with all the resources of anima mundi at his disposal, there is no saying to what extremes he may not go. La petite, vient, and manger. And the more power he gets, the more he will want. And the more his desires are gratified, the more he will become satiated and require fresh stimuli to his jaded appetites. This is no fancy picture. History tells us of the emperor Tiberius offering great rewards to anyone who would discover a new pleasure, and Nero burning Rome for a sensation. Picture such men in possession of a knowledge of psychic laws which would place all the powers of anima mundi at their disposal. And then imagine not one such, but hundreds or thousands combining in some common enterprise under the leadership of some preeminently gifted individual and recollect in this connection the accumulated power of massed mental action. And what must the result be? Surely, just what the Bible tells us, the working of all sorts of prodigies, which to the uninstructed multitude would appear to be nothing else than miracles. The knowledge then of the enormous possibility stored up in anima mundi, or the soul of nature, is the great instrument through which the power of Antichrist will work. It is indeed the acquisition of this power that will more and more confirm him in his idea of self-deification, and note that through for convenience I use the singular pronoun. I am speaking of a class, that is, of all who do not offer to God the sincere worship of trust in the divine love, wisdom, and power. I use the name Antichrist as that of a class, and one which seems likely to be widespread before long, though this is in no way excludes the possibility of some phenomenally powerful leader of this class attaining to a preeminence which will make him the typical manifestation of this principle of self-deification. Antichrist, whether as class or as individual, has attained to the recognition of a great universal principle, which I have endeavored to set forth in this and other books the principle of the introduction of the personal factor into the realm of unseen causes is laid hold of a great truth. All progress beyond the merely generic working of the law of averages is to be made by the introduction of the personal factor. But the mistake which Antichrist makes is that he cannot see any personality but his own. 
He sees the soul of nature and the power of its responsiveness to the personal elements in the mind of man, and he sees no further. Therefore, after his own fashion, he recognizes a spiritual factor of mere forces, but he does not recognize beyond the presence of the God of gods. Daniel 11, 36-38 Logically, therefore, he becomes to himself the person. He rightly says that the law of cause and effect is universal, and that the expansion of this law to the production of hitherto unknown effects depends upon the introduction of the personal factor. But he does not understand the reinforcement of the individual human personality by a divine personality, the recognition of which would bring in the principle of worship, which from the standpoint of his imperfect assumption of premises, he logically denies. To this power based upon self-deification, there is opposed the opposite power based upon the worship of God. And the fact to be noted is that they are both using the same instrument. Both work by the power of the personal factor acting upon the impersonal soul of nature. The anima mundi is itself simply neutral. It is responsive to impression and generative of the conditions corresponding to the seed sown in it. But entirely impersonal, it is without any sort of moral consciousness and will therefore respond equally to the impress of good or evil. Therefore, in estimating the final result, anima mundi may be entirely eliminated from our calculations. To put it mathematically, if anima mundi be represented by the same quantity on either side of the equation, it may be struck out from both sides, and then the real calculation will involve only the remaining factors. In the case we are considering, the only other factor is that of personality, and consequently the ultimate question at issue is this, on which side is the greater force of personality? The answer to this question is to be found in the cosmic creation. We are part of that creation. Our personality is part of it. Our personality proceeds by derivation from the all-originating spirit, and therefore, logically, that spirit must be the infinite personality. It is true, we cannot analyze or fathom the profundities of that spirit, and from this point of view, we may speak of it as the unknowable, and so we may not be able to define that all-creating spirit's consciousness of personality may be to itself, but unless we entirely deny our derivation from it, must it not be clear that it must contain the infinite potential of all that can ever constitute personality in ourselves? And if this be so, then the growth of our own personality must be proportioned to the extent to which this potential flows into us, and to adopt the receptive mental attitudes towards our Creator which will allow of such an inflowing is to take the attitude of worship which Antichrist denies. Therefore, the greater power of personality is on the side of the worshippers of God. Then, if this be so, their control over the powers of the unseen is greater than that of Antichrist, but they do not seek to control those powers in the same way that he does. He knows no personality but his own, and so he seeks to gain this control by his own knowledge of particular laws and by his own force of will, and is thus limited by the capacities of his own personality, however extensive they may be. His method is to consciously control Anima Mundi for his own purpose by his own strength. Those on the opposite side do not seek to subject Anima Mundi to their personal will. Many, perhaps the majority of them, do not even know that there is any such thing as the Anima Mundi, and so they rely on a simple trust in the Father. And those among them who do not know it know also that the worshiper of God may eliminate entirely from consideration as I have already said, and so they also rely upon simple trust in the Father, the only difference being they know something of the nature of the medium through which the unseen powers are working on both sides, and the ultimate question is only that of personality. They should have a yet stronger faith than their less instructed brethren, though in kind it is still the same faith, that of the Son in the Father. Whether then instructed in these matters or not, the worshipers of God will by their very faith and worship be exercising a constant influence upon anima mundi, attracting all those conditions which must tend to their final victory over the opposing force. Their worship enshrines the all-creating spirit in their hearts, and their thoughts of him and desires towards him go forth into the soul of nature, impregnating it with the seed of the good, the beautiful, and the life-giving, which must assuredly bring forth fruit in its own likeness in due time. Their method may not produce the sensational effects which may 
perhaps be produced by their opponents when the development of psychic forces reaches its climax. But in the end, all such temporary wonders will be swept away by the overflowing power which must result when Anima Mundi becomes permeated by Animus Dei, not merely as now in the generic sense of the maintenance of the world, but also in the specific sense of the introduction of the personal factor in its complete divine manifestation. Thus it will be seen that in the grand delineations of the closing scenes of the present age, the Bible nowhere departs from the universal law of cause and effect. There is a reason for everything if we can only penetrate deep enough to find it. And the laws of causation with which we are gradually gaining a better acquaintance in the realm of our own mentality are the same laws which in their wider scope embrace nations and make history. When we see this, the why and wherefore of even that great climax of the present age, which the Bible sets before us becomes intelligible, we may not be able to predict specific events, but we can recognize the development of principles. And so we see more clearly the meaning of those inspired prophecies which would otherwise be enigmatical to us. Then when we see those prophecies are in no way isolated from the natural laws of the universe, but rather are based upon them, and are in fact the description of those very laws operating in their widest field of action on the human plane, we shall feel the more confidence in those hints of definite measures of time which they afford us. This is a very important part of their message, and though we may not be able to reckon the precise day or year, we may may yet come to a very close approximation of our present whereabouts in the chronological calendar. And there are many indications to show that we are very rapidly approaching the climax, which the Bible calls the end of the age. This, however, is far too large a question for me to open up in these concluding pages, and perhaps it may be my privilege to treat of it at some future time. But I have endeavored here to offer some suggestions of the general lines on which the Bible student may intelligently approach the subject, realizing the close connection that exists between the Bible teachings regarding the forgiveness of sin, the spirituality of worship, the development of personality, and the originative action of the all-creating spirit. These are all parts of the one great whole and cannot be disassociated. To dissociate them is to pull down the edifice of the divine temple, to realize their unity is to build it up that true temple of God, which is the individuality of man made perfect by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This concludes The Devil and the Spirit of the Antichrist by Thomas Troward. Some of this is hard to understand. He's using an older kind of language. Let me give you my best interpretation of what he's saying. First of all, in the first part where he's talking about the devil, he's saying there's only one God. That means there is no separate devil. The devil is God, and there is no overriding force of negative. That force is always creating, and what, what appears to be disintegration is actually just another force of creation. But there may be individual devils, and it's reasonable to assume that if people live after life, that they carry the same beliefs and ideas and moralities, and people that are of an evil nature will be evil spirits. And then he goes into the law of attraction saying you will attract those spirits to you that are similar to your frequency. We talk about this all the time. You attract energies and spirits to you of your frequency. So if you're of the frequency of love, of something positive, then you're going to attract spirits that are of those energies. And if you're of the negative of fear, of anger, you're going to attract negative spirits and energies that in their original time on earth were of those specific energies and frequencies so individually there are probably groups of spirits that are negative but there is no devil the devil is symbolic in the bible really interesting discussion of the antichrist here and it took me a little time to understand it as i was reading it but then it really became clear when he's talking about the animus mundi and the power of the subconscious mind remember what he's saying is that we are all becoming understanding of the power of the subconscious mind and there will be a group of people that will become aware of the power of the subconscious mind and the power of the laws of the universe but dissociate it from god the power works for everyone no matter what and so some people will seemingly create miracles with the power of their minds but they will do it for themselves and that is why the law of one material and so many other books that we've read indicate this separation of self the idea 
that if you deify the self, that it's all about the self, and if you're seeking out this power for the self, that is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the one that seeks out these powers and uses these powers for the self. But if you embrace the idea of a universal mind, a universal spirit, and try to align yourself with the pattern of that universal spirit, where you go beyond your own self, you go beyond the deification of your own self, your desires for yourself, that is when you embrace what is the Christ. That is the Christ principle. That is the two principles that are at work. It is the battle between the self and those that are of service to others. That is what he's talking about. And we're seeing it now. He also indicates the more we have knowledge, the more it works against us. More people are getting more and more knowledge, but it's all about this power and how it's applied. We all become powerful, not just the people that are trying to help others. It's the people that are super selfish too. Everybody gets this power. And if you only use this power to further your own ends, never helping anyone else out, that is the spirit of the Antichrist. In any case, let me know what you think. His other lectures are much different in that they are not as biblical, but I found this is a cool thing to talk about these two chapters. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. Sending all the love, happiness, and joy to everyone listening. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.